On the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War, the National Trust for Historic Preservation considers that it is imperative that we tell the full story of that conflict. Of course, that may begin on the battlefield, and the National Trust has worked to preserve historic battlefields for many years. We also care about the stories of contraband heritage of those 500,000 women, children, and men who liberated themselves, emancipated themselves, and in the course of doing that, influenced the political climate and hastened the formal emancipation. Today, those inspiring stories can be used to help us better understand and promote dialogue around the pursuit of justice and also self-determination. That's why the National Trust is seeking to understand the location of contraband heritage sites and also to better understand where those historic sites are well interpreted and well preserved. Today we will visit two sites associated with contraband heritage in Alexandria, Virginia. Looking at the definition of contraband, if I am a formerly enslaved person who is seeking freedom behind Union lines, I now become officially contraband of war. As a, a member, as a, as a contraband of war, I receive protection from the Union Army. My labor may be used to help and aid the Union defenses in the country during the Civil War, but I also have a fairly good guarantee of freedom and freedom for my family and freedom of movement in this particular area where I'm protected and where my master cannot reach me and cannot bring me back into slavery. Here in Alexandria, uh, you know that when the war began, uh, this was a city that was, was part of the Confederate area. Um, the federal government was not holding uh, slaves per se. So this became an area where runaway slaves who were called contraband were able to come for uh, freedom. So, as, as much as you were free in that day. They were able to come here and, and start new lives. And that's what happened. It really starts with three African-American men who were slaves who decided once the, the Union were, were occupying Fortress Monroe to come over by boat to see if they could meet with the general to request their freedom or to be housed or to be kept at, for protection at the fort. And I think that that probably is really the beginning of the story and Butler's decision to decide, are these people going to be, what are they going to be? Can they stay here? Should they go back? He decided that he would make them contraband of war. And it said that shortly after he did this, this terminology actually became quite, quite popular uh, in, in Virginia. It was used very frequently. And he offered them protection. And then shortly after these three men received protection, even though their owner sent an emissary over to to get them back, and he was refused, many more people saw that now as a chance to go to Fortress Monroe for freedom, including an ancestor of mine, William Roscoe Davis. So for me, it's a personal story, and Fortress Monroe and Hampton is really a symbol for me of my family's freedom and the beginning of my family's journey. Shallow was organized back in 1863. Uh, our, our dates are a little murky back there, but uh, we have references that show 1863. Uh, there were 50 former slaves who were staying at the uh, slave pen, which is at 1315 Duke Street. When all these people began to come into Alexandria, they had to have somewhere to stay. So they were allowed to stay in that slave pen. And those people in that slave pen are the ones who got together in the mess hall and created church had church services, they were called the Old Shiloh Society. And you need to remember also that back in those days, uh, we could not congregate by ourselves. They were afraid we would do something, so there always had to be a white presence. When you have so many people coming into an area, say, looking at Alexandria, when you look at the, the contraband population that came in, probably over 8,000 people coming into this city, and they were probably just under half of the, the, the population of the city, it makes a change. You're looking at the 
the, the job situation changing. You're looking at the, the landscape. You're looking at shanties going out. People needed places to live, uh, places where they could find food. And so it does change the policy. You become a visible representation of what is going on in the war. People can see that these are families that are struggling, that are really working to become free. And so it really becomes part of the greater national dialogue when you see this influx of people who are desperately trying to get away from horrible situations uh, throughout the South. And, and they're really trying to capture and to be a part of what everyone in America is supposed to be entitled to, and that is the basic rights of freedom. Lots of people were sold in different ways and different places, and they, they, they were able to find themselves. And, and when they found themselves, they, they formed little communities. They formed communities of interest and family and whatnot. And, and God was always important, always, always, so that they had to have a church. You just had to. The Alexandria uh, Contraband and Freedmen Cemetery uh, which we hope will be a memorial uh, very soon, uh, has this, is the site of over 1,700 burials of men, women, and children who were contraband of the Civil War. Uh, these were, again, in, in many cases, enslaved men, women, and children who were escaping from other areas in the South and looking for freedom and protection behind the Union lines here in Alexandria. We know that there were at least 1,700 burials of men, women, and children at that site. Now, over the years, that cemetery site was impacted by many things. It was never meant to be built on, but over time, because this was not a, f a formal cemetery, it was not a cemetery for wealthy people, the wooden markers disintegrated. Over time, it probably just looked like a green, grassy field. And uh, over time, of course, people began to build on it. So you end up with an office, you end up with a gas station, and the legacy of the people who were buried there is forgotten. And unfortunately, and that would have been the case if it hadn't been for, for two wonderful community women, Lily Finkley and Louise Massoud, who founded the Friends of the Freedmen Cemetery and had uh, memorial celebrations at that site, even when it was a gas station, even when there was still an office building there. And they made people aware of the fact that even as you're driving down the George Washington Parkway to, um, to head, say, to Mount Vernon, you were driving, on, driving actually through what was probably the original part of the cemetery. It had been impacted by the GW Parkway development. It had been impacted through putting in road, other roads and sidewalks. So we don't have the original scope of the, the entire scope of the land the way it was. But I do say that the city of Alexandria, to its credit, in 2007, purchased the gas station and the office building, had them torn down so that we could have a reconsecration ceremony in 2007 that had over 500 people in attendance. For me, contraband heritage, especially during the years of the sesquicentennial now, as we're really re-examining uh, America's role in the Civil War and the impact of the Civil War during the sesquicentennial celebration, it's a chance to tell in detail and in more depth the story of African American life. It's not just the idea that African Americans were slaves during the Civil War, and then after the Civil War, they were free. It's much more complex than that. When you're looking at half a million people who are, are struggling for freedom, who are contraband of war, and you're looking at their legacy, but you're looking at it through the eyes of the academic world, in some ways it is easy to discount the impact of those people. Let's put it in context. Let's reread these entries. Let's see what they're giving us in perspective of what's going on as a whole. And let's really read through and look at, um, look at images of people from the period, looking at um, how they might have lived. From the Freedmen Cemetery, we've been able to, as I said, document and to find here in Alexandria, many members who are still uh, direct descendants. And we have their stories. We have their family histories. So you are seeing that. And as people get older, especially African-American families, they are beginning to write down these stories and to capture them. And I think there has been this great move for oral history and a respect for the role of oral history as part of the academic canon that you can't discount everything just because you say, well, we have no concrete proof that this happened. You can look at the greater context and see if certain events that are mentioned in an oral history did occur at the time the person said they occurred. There are ways to incorporate it into the canon. And I think that for many years, while slaves or formerly enslaved people were just seen as this mass of, mass of people that we have to uh, get to assimilate into American culture, we're now seeing that they had their own culture. Mm -hmm. And it's time to examine that culture 
and make that part of what we do in academia. Well, you know, one of the things to inspire people about the story, you have to start with yourself. Uh, do you want to know it? And if you want to know it, then you have to go out and look up the information. Um, I will be the first one to say that when people began to talk about the Civil War, that was not something I wanted to talk about because I was looking at the surface and not the deep down uh, feelings of Civil War. Uh, There's this a big story out there. Those, there. There are people that are, there are people that we, we need to know and touch in order to bring a reality to us. And we need to know about the story of the people that were around during those times so that uh, we can sort of feed off their strength because their backbone helped us and we're now trying to make a bridge for our youngsters to follow. So it, it's a continuous pattern.